Welcome to Deep on the BBC. My name is Ted Jeffrey, and joining me this week is a barrister and political writer. Uh, my guest has written for multiple publications such as The Telegraph, The Daily Mail and The Guardian. I am, of course, talking about Rupert Myers. Rupert, thank you for joining us. Uh, now, this week, Conservative MP Chris Loder slammed the BBC for its climate panic agenda, basically saying that the corporation shouldn't be making children feel guilty and anxious for eating meat. Rupert, why has the BBC become so hell-bent on ramming their climate agenda into the faces of licence fee payers, most of whom just want to watch TV to either be informed or entertained, not to be preached at? I mean, you'd have to ask them, but obviously they would, they would probably tell you that uh, informing their audiences is, is what they're doing. Um, I think one of the tricky things for people who defend the BBC, and one of the things that I increasingly find it uh, difficult to understand, is how the BBC makes editorial judgments about which issues are contested and therefore should present both sides of the argument, or a mul if it's a multifaceted argument, different sides, and then which issues it, it's decided a, a, a kind of settled settled opinion. Um, I'm not sure how they do that, and in fact, I'm I'm increasingly not sure how. Um, they can justify the, the approach in which if you watch or listen to the BBC news output or any BBC output, there'll be some discussions and some issues in which um, tenets of, of the editorial position are unchallenged. And there are others where they sort of both sides it and they have two talking heads, uh, generally speaking, from the most nonsensically extreme uh, sides of each argument in an attempt at sort of false balance, where, as you say, the majority of people almost everybody would fall probably somewhere in the middle between those two positions. Um, obviously, uh, the, the BBC will, will, will say, well, there's this you know, settled science in respect of, of climate change. They might try to argue that I think 96% of scientists accept that climate change exists. But it's difficult, in, in my view, for an organization that is trying to be a national public broadcaster um, to take a campaigning position on, frankly, anything. I think it's it's tricky to justify uh, private news organizations and newspapers, et cetera, can campaign for things. And that, that makes total sense. They're privately owned. The, the, the proprietors can go out and say, we believe in X, we think that Y should happen. But where you have something which is effectively not a government organization, but an organization with, backed with the threat of force, and that's what the ultimate threat of imprisonment of people who don't pay the license for years, um, how can they, if, if their, their real remit is impartiality, how can they justify campaigning on take an opinion on that and, and carry everybody with it? Uh, I, and I think that that comes to the heart of why I think that the BBC needs a different funding model. And I think the BBC would thrive as a private subscription service because that might allow it to have the sort of campaigning opinions and agenda that it seems determined to want to have um, but without necessarily the backing of the entire pop population for doing so. And there seems to also be this issue at the BBC that when they run out of local stories that uh, you know serve to kind of at times stoke division, they then resort to covering sort of woke biles from across the Atlantic at the expense of the license fee payer. Now, with countless US correspondents across the pond, is it not time that the BBC look to cut back on some of those appointments and instead focus on the UK, especially given that most of the people feel underrepresented by this current news coverage? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed with US news, so I'm probably not the best person to ask. Uh, I, I, I read a lot of US, US news output. Uh, I, I did find it strange, and I continue to find it strange, the extent to which uh, we focus on U.S. politics far more than we do the politics of, say, Ireland um, or Europe. Um, why is it that we spend so much more time and money covering U.S. presidential elections than than we do worrying about what's happening in, in France or Germany, which, you know, arguably uh, might have a more of an impact on us? And I think, look, you and I might agree or disagree, I don't know, on... Um, how the BBC reports foreign news. I, I will say this, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, that the BBC, when it comes to, particularly the foreign matters, and often American ones, 
doesn't both sides them in the same way that it would if it was a UK political position. So for example, if it's if they were covering a UK politician, they would they would in most cases strive to have somebody who defended that politician and somebody who attacked that politician. Um, that doesn't seem to happen so much in respect of US politics. Uh, in respect of US politics, the, the, it's fair to say that one could detect a certain level of bias in, in the reporting and the coverage there um, that perhaps fits the agenda of many of the people who work at the BBC. Maybe we'll come on to discuss that. But I think in respect of uh, the, the level of focus that the BBC has on um, US, uh, what you described as the woke agenda uh, and what many people I know would criticize as that, I think the, the really interesting thing is the extent to which the BBC's news gathering and news production system seems to be beholden to uh, what happens on social media. Now, I, that's ironic, I know, because the, this conversation is probably going to go out on social media, and, uh, but the, the whole world is not social media. And in fact, increasingly, we see a disconnect between um, what happens and what's focused on, on social media and, and, and what's happening in the lives of, of as you say, ordinary um, ratepayers. And the extent to which, not just the BBC, to be fair, most news organizations gather their news and focus their news agenda on what's happening on you know the social media networks that you and I and um, doubtless lots of uh, TV producers are on it is a source of concern to me and does tend to give um, too much focus and too much attention um, to uh, a, quite a narrow agenda of a particular subset of the population and, and I think from, from that point of view um, as you say it is unjustifiable uh, I, I do fear that we're not spending enough of our um, journalistic resources looking at things like you know intergenerational inequality or um, rising knife crime in in, in London um, you know things that really do matter to people on a fundamental day-to-day -day level and we're spending a lot more time um, talking about what's trending I mean you look at the BBC news output you look at their web page or what they're putting onto social media um, they, they spend a lot of time focusing on uh, what's exciting people on the internet right now and a lot less time looking at uh, what are the really big structural issues that um, ordinary people are facing and doing real you know, investigative journalism into those. There are a lot of good people at the BBC. Uh, I've got friends at the BBC, I've worked with the BBC, um, and I'm, I wouldn't want to tar everyone with the same brush. And to an extent, this is a wider problem uh, throughout journalism. But again, the difference between you know, the Guardian or the Times or the Telegraph and the BBC is that uh, I, I, don't, I don't face the threat of going to prison um, for, for not uh, for not subscribing uh, or not paying for the subscription to the Guardian, and and you've really got to justify quite on quite a significant basis that that distinction, and I'm not sure the BBC can. Obviously, something that every and, and another sort of value that people clo uh, hold very close to their hearts is truth, and uh, as we've seen in the last week, new documents have revealed that the BBC was more concerned with punishing the truth than investigating as to whether or not Martin Bashir had faked documents to secure the Princess Diana interview. Now, when an organization funded by the public, which stands on a mantra of being a public service broadcaster, acts in this way, surely that's the point when we then know it's time to stop paying for a corporation which refuses to adhere to basic journalistic principles. I mean, again, one could say that uh, journalism across the piece is not entirely without a certain level of um, subterfuge. And we saw from the Leveson inquiry that you know journalists of all stripes uh, and from all political persuasions uh, can get caught up in things that uh, Joe Public might find to be distasteful. I don't know the details of the Bashir case. It's not something I followed. Um, but you're absolutely right in the sense that if you're going to threaten people with imprisonment, um, then your output has to be above reproach. And nobody's going to get it right all of the time. And I, I, I do think, frankly, that the BBC would, would thrive as a subscription model. It would thrive around the world. It's hard to see why it didn't do it. it it's hard to see why you know, early successes like iPlayer could have become a global commercial success. I don't think the BBC needs the backing of the state. It would be a lot easier for the BBC if it weren't uh, backed by the state and it would it would remove what i think is almost a fiction that the bbc is an organization which is uh, different completely different from other journalistic institutions of course it can't be it's filled with the same people with the same great talents and skills but also the same flaws as people in all other journalistic 
institutions. It's not going to be perfect. Um, but when when you when you it's a bit like the government when you you know when you put it to that standard and it doesn't ever really achieve it or it very rarely achieves it. So I would I would disentangle it from um, the provisions of the legal system that allow it to prosecute old women for you know not, not, pay, not paying for the subscription. Why anybody's being threatened with jail for not paying for Mrs. Brown's poems is uh, is is it, well, it mystifies me. They would be threatened with jail for producing the stuff. But um, in answer to your question, um, I I don't think that. Uh, we can pretend the journalists of the BBC are going to be a great deal better than journalists anywhere else. And so we shouldn't treat them any differently and they should be a private organization. And I would wish them all the best. And I would probably subscribe like I do to Netflix and to Amazon Prime and to The Times and to other organizations that produce news. Um, I, I just think that we've put them in this tricky spot because they possibly started out as a, uh, you know, with a, a much clearer remit of just producing news. And if, maybe if they just did that very narrow thing of producing news, some of the stuff they're producing at the moment, like uh, Ros Atkins on the BBC produces these fantastic um, forensic explanation videos uh, in just a few minutes of what's going on. Um, not grandstanding, um, but actually simply informing and uh, expressing detail uh, of a sort that people appreciate. If the BBC could get back to that and hone itself into that, um, it would... It, it would do a lot better. But in the Bashir case, well, you see you see what you see in, in across the piece when you have ambitious journalists. You see people trying to make a name for themselves and occasionally they'll cut corners. Um, and we hold the BBC to a higher standard, um, perhaps, uh, perhaps fairly so. Um, but I, I don't think it's a tenable standard uh, for them to adhere to when there's such a, a behemoth of a, an organization trying to do so many things in local news, in international news, online. Um, they, 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 I, I think they've, they, they, they're too large an organization to do the very narrow public service remit, uh, and they're always going to make those sorts of mistakes. And uh, I, I don't see why they exist in the way that they do at the moment. And carrying on with that theme of talking about BBC reporters, last weekend we saw anti-lockdown protesters taking to the streets. Um, and it was actually in you know, some of the BBC's coverage and some of their tweets uh, that were being sent out by BBC reporters that stated that the protesters who were there and who were present were all extremists, basically going around shouting that COVID is a hoax. Now, although in, there indeed was, uh, a, there were a few extremists attending the protest, what they seem to miss out on is the fact that the majority of the individuals there were purely the anti-lockdown purposes, and they weren't indeed anti-COVID. Is this not an example of, again, lazy reporting and pandering to a particular agenda as well? I mean, I haven't read all of the output, uh, and I have to say that I was horrified by some of the things that, I mean, people were wearing the Star of David at that protest, um, and, and, you know, traducing the, the, the victims of the Holocaust by referring, um, you know, I mean, I'm, look, I'm frustrated as anybody is by this lockdown, and I think in some ways it's gone on. I've complained about it going on um, for too long, uh, but but I was I was personally horrified by the by the things I saw happening at that protest. So I but I can't come in I can't come in on on the news. What I do know um, is that you know BBC journalists routinely get into trouble for favouriting or liking things that you know uh, support one version of events over, over another or support one political party over another. And it's, it's no surprise. There was a guy who did some really interesting research back when um, Facebook was a lot less secure than it is now, where he looked up the political persuasions, the avowed political interests of uh, people who went to the BBC, because you could search by email address and you could search by political interest. And it was overwhelmingly the case that um, BBC journalists and employees um, would prefer to say that they supported the Labour Party than supported the Conservative Party. It's also true that the, the uh, BBC purchases copies of the Guardian newspaper at a rate that far outstrips the, the national percentage, if you were to you know, say how many people as a percent of the UK buys the Guardian newspaper. It's several multiples of that that buy it within the BBC. So do I think that the BBC is made up of people who have a certain political background overall? Yes, I think, I think, I think they probably do tend um, towards a left-wing political background. That might be because journalists tend towards a left-wing political background. I don't know. Um, but it is always going to produce um, the sort of inherent bias in the way that one looks at you know, any political news story. 
um, that's going to skew it. And as I say, if you look at the things that the BBC chooses to one side, arguments where it's, it's effectively assuming a political or moral perspective versus the things that it considers to be contested, um, you can very quickly start to spot um, biases in the way that the BBC approaches certain stories. Um, and it's human nature. I mean, it's, you're not going to eradicate it completely, but that's why from my perspective, the BBC should be brought back on, down to the level that all other news organisations operate at, where it doesn't have this strange state-backed um, threat of imprisonment to support it. It should be a commercial entity. And then critics like myself and, and yourself and other guests on this video series um, wouldn't have such a strong opposition, wouldn't be able to criticise it so much because it'd just be like, you know, the the the... the, the, the Star or the Sun or the or the Guardian, it would it would just be yet another organisation, which and they all have a bias. Let's not pretend that they don't. And a lot a lot of people have also been saying that aside from the, the sort of BBC bias amongst journalists, and looking at uh, sort of other sectors such as the arts and entertainment, that comedy at the BBC is dead. Now, as some now I, I didn't mention this in fact in your intro, but you've kind of dabbled in some satirical and comedic writing in the past. You, you co-wrote uh, a musical about Jeremy Corbyn. So as somebody who's yeah. tried their hands... Really <laughs> and as somebody who's tried their hands in that area, do you think there is a substantial creative and talent deficit at the BBC? And is this because young aspiring comedians, writers and creators are making a career for themselves elsewhere on other commercial platforms. So I, I have an, a number of issues with this comedy thing because I, I mean, some people will tell you uh, that it's inherent in comedy, uh, successful comedy, that it is left wing because it's about uh, this concept of punching up and punching against dominant power structures. I, I, I think that's nonsense. I think you can see a number of very successful comedians. I'm a big fan of Jeff Northcott, who is on um, you know, the, the, the MASH Report, a, a show which I'm very sad ended because um, unlike a lot of people on the right, I, I, I think it's possible to laugh at left-wing comedy. I, th I, don't think, I don't think it's inherently unfunny when someone mocks your political persuasion. Um, I, 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 it is a shame that there isn't more of a space for people doing it to the left. Um, and that may be because of bias within the hiring structures at the BBC. It may be because more comedians uh, are left-wing than right-wing. I mean, certainly I can name some very successful right-wing comedians, but one gets the sense, in fact, that most of the comedians who might you know, vote for the right or for centrist parties tend to shut up about it, um, whether because of fear of commercial backlash or because, um, look, I think generally speaking, people who are in the center or on the right in politics just tend to talk about politics less than people on the left. You know, if you did the elections going on right now and you drive around East Anglia where I am and you'll see a lot more, you know, um, placards and posters up for the left than you do the right. And I think in part because people on the right perhaps feel that there are more important fish to fry than talking about politics all day. And so it may well be, unfortunately, that a lot of uh, funny people who are um, on the right or in the centre uh, feel that there are more funny things to make jokes about than politics, and that there are more interesting things to make jokes about than politics. So it's a, it's a much more complicated... I'm, I don't think that the BBC is going out of its way to not find people on the right who are funny, but I, I think there is an issue with comedy that on a number of levels. So firstly, as I say, I don't think that, I think most comedians may well be left wing. I think the people on the right may, may make different uh, career choices. But secondly, I think that the comedians on the right generally have um, tended to stay away from political material. Now, Jeff Northcott might be, maybe, um, maybe changing that. Um, you know, he may be beating a path for, for more people to, to follow. And if he does, good for him uh, because because it, I, there's lots, there's lots. I think in politics, it's funny. That's why I co-wrote co -wrote a, a comedy musical that took the Mickey out of all sides. Uh, because I think that, frankly, if you can laugh at one person's politics, you can certainly laugh at somebody else's. And my goodness, you could laugh at Jeremy Corbyn's. Indeed, wise words, Rupert. Well, thank you very much for joining us at Deep on the BBC today. It's been a real pleasure. To, thank you very much indeed. It's uh, it's it's nice to be able to talk about these things, and it's good to see people campaigning for something. I I, I think that the, I don't think the BBC shouldn't exist. I just think that the BBC would do a lot better if it were to free itself from the shackles of this crazy charter renewal process and this crazy model of subscription uh, where we all have to uh, pay or we or we face jail. I think they they remove 
the oxygen from critics if they just said, look, let's become a private organization and uh, raise money the same way Netflix or The Times or anybody else does. Well, absolutely. And on, unfortunately, Calvin, you know, hasn't been with us this week. I've been standing in, but uh, I know that he would say, as he normally does when he rounds up these interviews, keep fighting the good fight. Thank you very much.